Thank you, Sam, for this introduction. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today for this webinar. My name, again, is Sabah Rashid, and today I will be speaking about helium ion microscopy, introduction, and applications. Um, I recently joined the CCEM in June this year, um, and before that, I worked at University of Ottawa at the Center for Research in Photonics, where I spent most of my time in a nanofab facility. Um, so I'm happy to be here and uh, let's walk you through the today's webinar. All right, so let's talk about the outline of this webinar that we will be covering today. Um, I will start with brief history of helium, helium ion microscopy or simply the HIM and the Orion nanofab. Then we're going to talk about uh, the gas field ion source technology and the working principle that this microscope utilizes. And we're going to compare um, the helium ion beam to the electron and the gallium ion beams that conventionally used. Um, and that would include beam solid interactions. And then we're going to dive into some applications, including imaging and nanofabrication that would include milling and lithography. And we will be then concluding this webinar um, session. All right, so before we begin, I highly recommend watching the previous videos um, available on the CCEM uh, YouTube channels uh, presented by Travis and Huey on focused ion beam introductions and um, applications, which are mainly discussed on a gallium focused ion beam, but can be applicable to any focused ion beam in general, whether we're talking about what it means to change your beam current or what's your landing energy. Um, how do you change that? What kind of beam parameters that you can change? Uh, your scanning parameters, your um, sputtering yield and interactions of the beam and the sample. Um, all of this is well explained by um, Travis and Huey um, on the YouTube channel. So I highly recommend watching these videos um, if you plan to work with uh, Focus Ion Beam or the Orion Nanofab. Um, Hui mainly discusses the xenon plasma FIPS, which is different than um, gallium focused ion beam or helium, um, which is what we will be talking about today. All right, so let's begin with some history, very brief history on the helium ion microscope, which is based on the field ion microscope that was developed in the early 50s. Um, pretty much what they had here, you can look at the diagram, they had a sharp needle. Um, the best that they could do. A uh, spherical sharp needle with um, a radius of 100 nanometer that is subject to a high voltage and cryogenically cooled down. Uh, in the vicinity of uh, this column or apparatus, you introduce helium gas. And then uh, because of the presence of that high field, uh, the neutral helium gas will be ionized and then sent to the right in this configuration where it would interact with um, a screen or a fluorescent sc screen. On the other side, you have a camera and then you can record an image. So this apparatus or a microscope was the first um, observation of atoms and pretty much what they got is the image to the right, right here. Um, so there were developments in the 20th century, but nothing really that made it to um, commercialization. Up until 2005, there was a company called Atomic Level Imaging System Corporation, who um, or which introduced the first commercial helium ion microscope, and they called it the Orion. Then this company was acquired by uh, Carl Zeiss, where they were able to introduce their second generation of this microscope, and they called it the Orion Nanofab. So why am I mentioning this? Um, I'm mentioning this mainly because helium ion microscopy is young, especially if you compare it to other charge charged beam particles, including the SEM and mainly gallium focused ion beam, which um, this can open doors to new investigations and studies. So bring on your samples and let's investigate them under uh, the helium ion beam. All right, so this is the Orion nanofab that was installed at the CCEM at the end of last year. And the installation continued during this year as well. We're still in contact with Zeiss to make sure everything that works well. Um, it's pretty much usable and operating at this point. Uh, so this instrument is a dual, a dual um, ion instrument, which means you have two columns, uh, just like a FIPSEM. In your primary column right here, 
um, vertically, you can either use a helium ion beam, introduce helium into your column, or an neon ion beam. So you introduce neon gas to be ionized in here instead of a SEM in a FIB-SEM um, column. 54 degrees from that, you have your secondary column, which is the gallium capella focused ion beam, which ZEISS uses on different FIB-SEM instruments. So pre pretty much anything that you can do with a gallium FIB on any other instrument can be done uh, on here. So you have access to three beams. Um, another feature that is important here is the electron flood gun, which is hiding behind your gallium capella column right here. And this is important to neutralizing charge um, due to the positive accumulation of charge on the sample. Uh, images here are acquired with a secondary electron detector or the ET detector, Everhart Thornley, which is mounted right here on the chamber. Uh, this instrument also has a plasma chamber cleaning uh, right here, which can be important sometimes to clean the samples before working with them to avoid um, deposition of hydrocarbons that are present in the chamber and also to maintain the chamber clean at all times. All right, so let's talk about the gas field ion microscope, which is used by this uh, microscope. Uh, just like the uh, history slide that we have seen, um, we have a sharp round single crystal, which is at high voltage, positive voltage, the accelerator voltage, which also has an electrode underneath it, the extractor voltage at a high negative uh, voltage. Because of that presence of high field, you are able to ionize the neutral helium gas and then send it down into your column as helium plus ions. So wherever you see these half moons, um, this is called an ionization disk where the um, neutral atom can actually be in close proximity to the tip and then it gets ionized. What you see down here is a projection image of the, of the source. So any bright spots here that you see represents an atom of the single crystal um, tungsten source. So now if you imagine that we have a sharper needle um, in a way that you only have three atoms at the tip, uh, you're going to have what we call a trimer right here. So we have three atoms of the tungsten that are at the apex or at the top of your pyramid, um, surrounded by these atoms from the layers um, underneath it, which shows the single crystal of the, of the structure. So this is what we use in, in a helium ion microscope in terms of the source. Um, so now we're going to compare this gas field ion source to um, conventional field electron field emission gun, which is used by a scanning electron microscope and the liquid ion metal source that is used by um, gallium FIB. Very briefly and simple comparison, this is the same system that we showed on the previous slide. Um, the tip is cryogenically uh, cooled down with pumped liquid nitrogen um, between 70 to 80 Kelvin. Um, and here is a zoomed in view of the tip. Um, so the virtual size of your, um, of your beam is less than 0.25 nanometer just because of the atomic uh, source that you have on there. So this would, after the magnification of the source and alignment, uh, you can have a probe size down to 0.3 nanometer. So this source has a very high brightness and also low energy spread and small wavelength, which minimizes diffraction effects. So field emission gun, which is used by, by the scanning electron microscope, um, also uses a tungsten tip that is uh, 20 to 100 nanometer in size. So that's your virtual spot. When you focus it, it's also at a high voltage and it starts emitting the electrons and you can send them down your um, column. So the probe size that is possible with an electron beam is two nanometer. And then if we're talking about a liquid ion metal source, which is mainly used by um, gallium focused ion beams, you have the tungsten tip that has a liquid gallium reservoir on top that flows around the tip and then forms this Taylor cone or pretty much this droplet that is 10 to 15 nanometer in size. 
Again, same uh, principle, uh, you're generating your gallium ions down here after demagnification of the source, you can get down to 30 nanometer probe size. Of course, there are so many advancements in, in these sources. So maybe you have 20 nanometer probe size with gallium. Um, but in any, in any case, um, the helium ion microscope has the smallest probe size um, because it's atomically sharp. Um, it uses an atomically sharp tip. All right, so great, we have an amazing source. Um, do we always have access to the source? The answer is sadly no. You have to work on forming the source periodically when using the helium ion microscope. So you, this is um, a SEM micrograph of the tip that you have installed. Um, and what you see if we were to look at the SFIM or the scanning field ion um, microscope image, uh, this is what you see. So this is far from being atomically um, sharp at the tip right here. So there is a recipe that can be run within the Zen software that reshapes the uh, tip. You can see right here, another SEM micrograph that shows you the triangle right here or the pyramid structure. This process is um, a property of size. So not much is shared about the process. Um, you also get a live source view when uh, you build your source, which can tell you um, the current crystal structure of the source and also where uh, the temperature or the average temperature is measured. Um, so even after we get this source build, it's still far from being um, that trimer that we're after. So the process after that has to be done manually in that we have to form a trimer. So you start with something like this, maybe earlier on, this is still pretty good. Uh, you can have access to the, or you can have an image of all three sides of the pyramid um, and you have less of an ordered structure and you start peeling off the atoms until you end up with pretty much the trimer that we talked about. So this is done by increasing your extractor voltage and uh, pretty much evaporating um, the tungsten atoms until you end up with three atoms. All right, so the next step is to determine your best imaging voltage, which pretty much sweeps the extractor voltage to find you the highest emission current. So you can either look at the intensity of the trimer or you can look at the measured beam current. Um, and in that you're going to find that there is a maximum value that you have to set your trimer at in, in a permanent way when using this trimer. So this process has to be done, I would say on an average from one week to a month. If you're using another gas, maybe you have to do it more, um, more often. All right, so now we have to align this trimer after, um, after forming it. If you notice here, the, the trimer is not fully aligned in the middle or where your crosshair in the middle of your field of view. I cropped the images just so you have clear um, view of what I want to show you, but potentially you want one of these atoms to be aligned in the middle. And what that process does is this is what we have. So you have your um, source and it has three beams from these uh, three atoms that we formed. So what you wanna do is you want to tilt the gun head pretty much. So your beam would go through the beam limiting aperture, one of these atoms. So what that looks like in real life, this is what we call a top dead center. And this is what we start with when we build the source. And then to align it, we have to tilt the, uh, um, the head. So you can see this black structure is tilted in an extreme way to the right and towards us, not always like this, but I just wanted you to see it. And um, all right, so there is another mechanical alignment that can be done, which laterally brings the, the favorite atom into the middle of your um, field of view. So from here, this is going to be your emitter, and then you can send in your beam down the column. Uh, down the condenser and then scanning it onto your sample. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on here uh, because this is discussed earlier as well on these videos. So what we detect here is secondary electrons with the ET detector that are excited upon the interaction with the helium ion beam. All right, so 
what kind of gases we can have with a um, gas field ion source. So there are some characteristics that we should care about in that the source has to be not reactive um, with either the source and the sample, whether it's neutral or in its ionized state. We would like it to be of a light atom to minimize any surface damage and ensure deep penetration. And we would like it to have a high ionization potential, which is not really common sense. This is because gases with lower ionization potential require lower field strengths to become ionized. And this means before they approach the tip, they might get um, ionized earlier on. And therefore, um, these, these ions or these gases can actually bounce back because they have a higher polarizability when compared with gases with higher ionization potential. And potentially they could damage your, um, your source by sputtering. And obviously we do not want any reactive gases because these could change the shape of your tip. So you don't really want that. So in this table, you see that um, our options are helium and neon, and both of these gases are available on our instrument, on the Orion Nanofab at the CCEM. You notice that the, the neon um, ionization potential is lower than the helium. This means we have to set up the extractor at a lower extraction voltage, and this would perhaps allow other gases to reach the tip and therefore introduce more contamination into the column. Uh, this is something that it's fine and we can deal with because these columns are designed to be baked at least once a year to ensure um, to ensure there is no contamination. Plus, these gases can intentionally or unintentionally be uh, present in the column. So you want to be able to get rid of them if you suspect there is contamination or if you have some accidents where your vacuum breaks or um, anything like that. All right, so now we're going to get into beam solid interactions. We will uh, compare helium with the scanning electron microscope or simply just an E-beam. Uh, what you see here from these um, diagrams, um, an E-beam with a landing energy of 0.5. So here I show only the 0.5 um, interaction volume because at higher energy with the SEM due to the physical nature and how small the electron is, you're going to have a really huge interaction volume, um, which means you can't really um, compare it in terms of the signal to a helium ion beam. So most of the images when we compare the performance of an SEM to helium has to be done at lower um, landing energies if you're using a scanning electron microscope. So we can see that um, when you're electron beam interacts with the sample, it will um, generate secondary electrons type one upon interaction with your primary beam or the primary beam can scatter into the material and also uh, excites other electrons, which can find their way up. Um, and these are secondary electrons of type two. And also you can get backscattered um, electrons, which means uh, the signal that you have from SEM includes both SEE1 and SE2 that comes from the subsurface. So the surface information is going to be kind of limited if we were to compare it with the helium ion beam. Here, what you have, the helium ion beam at 30 kV interacts with the surface. Uh, you're going to mainly generate a really high yield of secondary electrons type 1. They don't have much energy as the uh, ones generated by the SCM, where they can actually go down and excite more electrons that will find their way up. Here you have the helium ion um, that pretty much neutralizes itself from the electrons that are released from the material and perhaps keeps traveling down um, until it gets implanted, or it can also excite other electrons down there. Um, but the electrons that gets excited with a helium ion beam, don't have enough energy to make it back into the surface to be detected. For that reason, you only have um, surface information. So you have a really, really high secondary electron yield if you were to compare it to um, the electron beam. So on this note, 
I'm going to remind you of the um, source, which gives you a really, really high resolution compared to SEM. And from here, we um, learned that we have a really high secondary electron yield. Um, and also we have longer depth of field just because of the physical nature of, of the atom and the uh, diffraction effects um, and the low convergence angle if we were to compare it to SCM, which will show us um, superb imaging. This concept as well, because um, this concept here as well enables the use of a flood gun, an electron flood gun that neutralizes the surface charge, which is accumulated due to the helium ions here, uh, that can be neutralized with an electron um, with an electron gun. With the SEM, um, you can see if you have kind of a local charge at the surface, positive because of all of these electrons that are leaving, and as the electron beam travels down, you're going to have um, negative charge down there if this sample was an insulator. So the fix around that is to actually coat it with a metallic layer to dissipate the charging, which could also compromise your um, resolution. So you don't really want that. So the helium ion microscope is um, excellent in imaging insulators and uh, biological samples without any modifications of the surface with coatings. All right, so now we're going to talk about ion solid interactions um, in that um, we will be pretty much explaining what happens when a helium ion beam um, interacts with a sample versus neon ion beam and a gallium ion beam. So here is a simulation, Monte Carlo simulation that models the sputter yield. And this is shown with the green dots on the diagram. Um, and then the implantation depth up to 400 nanometer here. Um, and then um, the red part shows you your primary beam pretty much or the incident beam. So all of these are done at 30 kV. You can see the interaction volume of helium is quite large. However, if we were to look at the first 150 nanometer, we see a well collimated beam compared to both neon and, and gallium. However, the sputtering yield of the silicon in this case, um, atoms is lower than uh, both neon and gallium. Therefore, milling with helium can be slower. And you can also have a lot of damage if we're using helium, but don't get scared. There are ways to work with the helium ion when, um, when milling. Um, neon is much smaller than gallium, therefore can be used for, um, for generating smaller features that gallium cannot uh, resolve easily. All right, so just to conclude, um, helium and neon beams penetrate deeper into the sample than gallium. That's what we learned from this diagram. And then helium and neon ion beams produce lower sputter yield um, of these SI atoms per incident ion. All right, so I said don't get super scared of what you saw on the previous slide because the damage also depends on the dose. So what we see here on the plot is uh, the defect density, so dislocations per uh, unit volume um, as a function of dose. So any dose that is below than one times 10 to the 15 um, ions per centimeter squared area is not going to have any defects observed with TEEM. So this would include imaging your substrate or even lithography, which falls into, um, into here if we were talking about the dose. So that's a way of working with the helium ion microscope. So not much defects can be generated um, below this dose. However, above this dose, you're going to have damage. Um, and this is a very famous thing that everyone who uses a helium ion microscope is familiar with, which is the bubbles. So the helium um, gas is kind of chilling underneath the surface, trying to leave, which um, produces these bubbles that no one wants to see. However, again, there are ways to work around it, and uh, we will get into it when we talk about the applications, which are coming shortly.
All right, so we're getting into the application uh, section. We're talking about imaging great right here. Uh, this is one of the best. Um, this is one of the best publications on uh, comparing the SCM image with an in-lens detector to just facilitate surface electrons to be detected and compare them to a helium ion microscope image, Im image with the ET detector. So this is a biological sample. There were no coatings on, on both cases. Um, on the HIM, an electron flood was used to neutralize the positive charge from the ions. Uh, the image is very clear. You can actually see that the features of the HeLa cells are very clear. The edges of, of them are very clear compared to the um, SEM. And here they did really try to, their best to optimize their beam. They're using a landing energy below 1 kV. Um, and if you see the image zoomed in, um, very clear difference in, in the resolution. So more imaging examples right here. So these are also biological samples um, using the electron flood gum on a helium ion microscope. So to the left, we have a human cell, pancreatic cell that is reported in literature. Your field of view here is 800 nanometer and they say that they resolve 0.8 nanometer uh, features on, on this um, micrograph. To the right, we have um, an image that was um, generated here at the CCEEM using the Orion Nanofab uh, of a bacteria from pre prepared by Marcia. Uh, so we can see superb surface details um, on, on, the, on both images. We can see that the surface can be visibly seen where the bacteria here is damaged or caught, whatever happened to it. Okay, so the first example that I showed is pretty much optimizing the SEM. Here is another way of um, seeing the difference between these two ions or charged particle beam. Um, so to the left, you have a scanning electron micrograph with 30 kV. And to the right, you have a um, HEM micrograph of carbon nanotubes. So because of the higher energy of the SEM, your beam goes through the carbon nanotube and pretty much you lose uh, most of your features. Whereas to the right, you can see uh, superb surface details um, and texture and roughness right here. So more HEM imaging with the electron flood gun. Here are some of my samples that I worked on. This to the left, you have etched structures into MGO single crystal. So MGO is an insulator. So here it's, I have no difference in material, it's just etched and you can see the surface roughness, clear surface roughness that is resolved with the helium ion microscope using the electron flood gun. Uh, the surface roughness was measured to be 2.9 with an atomic force microscope and compared to 0.8 nanometer where it shows a really smooth surface. To the right we have um, gold nanostructures that are fabricated on glass, also using helium ion microscopy. You can see the surface details um, of these structures, um, especially that these structures are on glass. So this would be very difficult uh, to be imaged with NSCM, especially in the case of MGO. So here are more examples of him imaging. To the left, we have a delaminated um, copper film, you see superb surface details and also a long depth of focus. Um, especially with these lazed AG pores, you can see the inside of the pores still in focus with all the details in addition to all of the um, surface roughness and ablated material around the, the pore. So other examples of high-res imaging with, um, with the helium is to the left. Here is an effect of pretty much utilizing charging. Um, so these were gold nanoparticles that were um, fabricated, um, and they wanted to pretty much have a look with, at them with the helium ion microscope. And we found that um, the material that you see right here is surrounded by residual material of the organic precursors that you, they use to fabricate these structures. Whereas on other regions, the nanoparticles seems to be um, cleanly, clean, more clean um, 
compared to this area. So here we can use the charging um, for the contrast and then um, investigate the cleanliness of the sample of uh, the fabrication and the transfer of, of these nanoparticles. To the right, we have another example that shows us crystallographic effects that we see channeling contrast of the helium ion beam upon interacting with the metal weld. So um, channeling contrast depends on the angle between the crystal axis axis and the incident beam. This is also well discussed in the um, introduction to focused ion beam by um, Travis. Uh, videos where um, he explains how you can get more or less of a signal based on the uh, crystal plane that you're imaging with your um, beam. All right, so we're going into our second application, which is nanofabrication milling. Um, here is kind of the best um, or the smallest feature that was reported in literature with um, a helium ion microscope used in material ablation or removal or etching, whatever you want to call it, in a 30 nanometer silicon nitrate thick film. So these pores are five nanometer in um, diameter, four to five nanometer, really. So they you have a really high aspect ratio of six, which any FIB person or any um, nanofabrication expert knows that this is a really high um, aspect ratio and it could be very difficult to, to achieve in materials. Um, this film is a freestanding membrane and I'll show in the next example why is that. Uh, supported across a window and a silicon chip. Um, their helium ion beam current is adjusted to five picoamps through 100, sorry, through 10 micron aperture. Um, and then they avoid imaging um, with the HIM just to not have more damage into, into this membrane that was milled. Um, and this is a scanning transmission electron um, image. So they report that smaller pores can actually be fabricated in this membrane, especially that you know their, their beam current is still at five picoamps. You can decrease it further using smaller aperture as well. Uh, so it is possible to fabricate even smaller than what they report. However, they were not super sure if, if the pore was fully going through, um, but it seems that they didn't um, try to go even smaller. Quite impressive. So the second example is um, along the same lines. You have um, a hole that is milled with a helium ion microscope in a graphene flake that is pretty much suspended in vacuum. And here you have um, the Monte Carlo simulation that would give you the, uh, the way around all of the damage um, that is caused by a helium ion interaction with, um, with your samples. So if you have right here graphene and SiO2, glass, and then silicon, you can see the, um, the beam interacting with the sample and the broadening of, of the beam. Maybe in the first 50 nanometer, it's well collimated and then um, it, it goes crazy and it starts implantation. They do notice some bubbles forming as well that we talked about. Um, however, if you suspend this flake, just like the example before this one, you're going to have a highly collimated beam uh, going through your uh, membrane or thin film or flake or whatever you're doing. And then all of the mess will be beyond the film pretty much that you're trying to mill. So this is the trick that um, most impressive results with uh, milling with the helium ion beam are um, reporting is they suspend the film uh, pretty much in vacuum. So there is nothing underneath what you're milling. So this project is what introduced me to the Orion Nanofab at University of Ottawa. So this is a plasmonic heptamer uh, nanohole array. It's used for, um, it was just a proof of concept for uh, the plasmonic effects. So they look at the optical response of these structures. Um, here they wouldn't, they, they weren't really trying to um, resolve smaller features. Uh, but this is what their simulation gave them for a specific response. So here, the simulation wanted 15 nanometer, a 15.7 gap was achieved with a relatively high beam current, I would say 10 picoamps through um, a 10 micron beam limiting aperture 
with a spot control of 3.5, which actually is just the condenser or lens one settings. And this means your crossover point is um, closer to the aperture. Therefore, you're going to have a higher beam despite having the same um, parameters on the previous examples using a 10 micron aperture. So with a helium ion um, beam, you have more freedom in, in choosing your ion beam current by um, changing the condenser. So you can focus your beam on the, pretty much on the aperture. You sacrifice resolution because you allow more beam to go through or above the crossover or above the aperture. And most of the beam would be blocked by your aperture and some of it will go through and you get a lower beam current. You can also change your um, gas pressure of the helium that is present around the tip. Uh, this also can either increase or decrease your um, beam current and also your apertures sizes. So here what they have is a 55 nanometer gold film on chromium on glass. Chromium is used as an adhesion layer because um, gold does not adhere to SiO2 or any oxide. Um, so what you see, they result really small um, features that cannot be otherwise resolved with a uh, conventional gallium focused ion beam. So in here, they um, also show you some of the tested doses. They note that 10 nanocoulomb per micrometer squared area is the dose that was required to clear um, the film of 55 nanometer of gold on, on glass, which gives you again, a relatively high um, aspect ratio of 3.5 to, to one. Uh, another feature that was important when fabricating these structures was uh, drift correction, which is equipped on the FIBIX engine or Atlas V uh, or the MPBE for anybody who's familiar with um, FIBIX software, which we're going to get soon installed on our Orion Nanofab. So we see the array without drift correction um, drifting, uh, whereas with drift correction by having a feature meld right here, uh, you get perfect alignment of these um, structures. So this is a 20 by 20 um, array that takes three hours to melt at this specific uh, beam current. And that's why it's prone to drift correct, to drift pretty much. And that's why you need to correct for drift. All right, uh, the next nanofabrication um, work that I'm showing here today is very interesting, uh, which is uh, fabrication of kurigami uh, structures, which is pretty much the art of cutting and folding paper, which generates 3D, um, 3D structures. So this can be done using all beams that are equipped on the Orion, the helium ion beam and the neon ion beam and also gallium ion beam. So the way it works, you first um, mill a feature with either helium or neon, and then you radiate the whole um, feature that was milled with the beams uh, with a gallium dose for, for the whole, you pretty much scan the area with a specific dose. Um, so what that does is going to bend the membrane. So I didn't mention that this is again, a suspended membrane, um, silicon nitride. Um, that is mounted on, on a frame. You have different thicknesses that were discussed in this work, 15 nanometer and 50 nanometer, and thickness also um, important here in terms of the dynamic of the, um, of, the, of the shape that bends afterwards. So because of the gallium irradiation, your shape is going to bend either upward or downward with um, a specific angle as well. So uh, the direction depends on the thickness. So um, this figure that you see right here, um, you see most of the structures are bending upward. This was used with 15 nanometer thick membrane, um, whereas the thicker membrane um, bent downwards for these structures. So the angle, of the, um, uh, the bending also depends on the gallium fib dose. Um, so here you see that um, the structure was milled with a helium ion, and then it was radiated with uh, gallium, and you can see how uh, these structures lifted. 
Same is here and here and there. You can also rotate your shapes to pretty much have different orientations of, of these shapes. So here they reported a helium ion beam current of five to 10 picoamps, which is um, the usual range when you're milling and ablating material. For neon, 1.5 to 3 picoamps, and gallium, very low um, current, 5 to 10 picoamps. All right, so one more application that was also reported in literature is them trying to thin a TEM lamella with neon beam instead of using a gallium focus ion beam. So pretty much you uh, fabricate the lamella with a gallium beam and up until you end up with 1500 nano or one micron thickness, you switch to a neon beam. However, they noticed that there was no improvement in terms of the amount of damage induced by the um, neon compared to um, a gallium beam. But they did suggest that this could be a very appropriate alternative for gallium if you are concerned with um, chemical modification of the sample by um, alloying with gallium, for example, or you're scared of contamination with gallium. So this can actually, or neon beam can be used to, um, to thin the lamella instead of gallium. Or in cases the gallium probe size is not small enough to, um, to melt the, or to thin the lamella. All right, so the last, application in here is um, lithography using the helium ion beam, which is mainly what I spent my time doing at U Ottawa and during my grad school. So lithography is not direct milling, it's a modification of a resist or a polymer that is sensitive to a beam or a charged particle beam. Um, and then usually it includes pattern transfer from one layer to another. So what you start with is any substrate. This can be silicon, this can be MGO, this can be anything. This process can be transferred and um, to different substrates, really doesn't really depend on the substrate. And here I want you to remember the damage um, plot that we showed earlier in that the doses that are used with the helium ion beam um, introduce no defects whatsoever um, into your substrates. So you can use silicon even, no bubbles. Uh, from there, you go going to apply your um, resist. In this case, it's PMMA. And then if you're working with um, an insulator, like in this case, glass or fused silica, you have to apply a thin film um, of a conductor that can dissipate charge. And then you start exposing the, um, the sample with your stack to a helium ion beam, and then you can either develop it so this means you dissolve what was exposed, and this is the positive regime of PMMA, or you can cross-link it. You can cross-link the polymer further or modify it chemically where uh, you dissolve everything and leave behind what was exposed. Then you're going to deposit metal or really whatever you want to. Um, and this would include a liftoff process. So you would end up with um, metallic structures, in this case, gold on, on your substrate. Um, from here, you can also transfer your pattern from the polymer uh, right here into the substrate by etching the substrate as well. So lithography usually um, talks about um, pattern transfer through uh, liftoff, depositions, and liftoff, or um, etching. So this is uh, the final structures in real life imaged with the helium ion microscope. These are nano antennas that are used for beam steering. And I'm going to overlay the pattern that was used to um, create them or fabricate, it, fabricate them. So this is very difficult to do just because um, in lithography, you have an enemy, which is called the proximity effects, and the electron beam suffers from, from that, which results in bigger dimensions than what you want. For that reason, people have to introduce proximity effects corrections into their designs or uh, push limits, cryogenically develop their samples. Um, and use state-of-the-art high KB voltages for the exposures um, 
in this instance, they would use 100 kV on an electron beam, whereas here uh, we have zero proximity effects if we were to compare it to this um, layout um, because of the uh, physical nature of the ion when compared to an electron beam, you really don't have much proximity effects. You do have some, but way less than what you have with an electron beam. And here we just show dimensions and compare them to the design. For this process, we have resolution tests that were uh, conducted as well. We were able to achieve an aspect ratio of 2.8 to 1. When you have transfer of the pattern, it's really difficult to achieve such ratios. The best reported aspect ratio in literature with the state of the art um, electron beam is 0.7 to 1. Um, and they pushed limits in that they uh, had to develop with a cold developer, minus 15 cent degrees centigrade, and they also exposed it with a 100 kV um, tool. So here you see that we have 18 nanometer wires or lines, whatever you want to call them. These are separated. Um, we also have smaller than that, 14 nanometer, which pretty much matches the spot size if you were to mill a spots or expose a spots into PMMA. So pretty much it depends on the resist as well that you're using and its glass transition temperature. When your structures are closely packed, the dimensions cannot be the same because of proximity effects. So the smallest that we were able to achieve was 20 nanometer with a duty cycle of 40 nanometer. So another application of lithography was with etching, and this was the uh, MGO single crystal. So we have different patterns that were um, fabricated uh, through lithography um, and helium ion beam exposures and development like we have seen before, but instead of depositing, um, this was wet etched with um, phosphoric acid. Um, and here we have pretty much not much damage or really zero damage if you were to mill these structures with gallium by depositing a conductive film on top and then preparing these um, structures. In experiments, so these were used for um, as optical components to focus an extreme UV beam, which has very high energy that is generated with also a very hot 800 nanometer infrared source. Um, they tried in the past to mill structures with gallium, which ended up having a lot of amorphous material in there that compromised the, the crystal and therefore the damage propagated with the beam along the experiment. So it was completely useless. Whereas here, this uh, Fresnel zone plate was used to actually focus an extreme um, UV beam down to 150 nanometer, which very well matches the theory um, of their approach. So to conclude today's session, helium ion beam excels in resolution, longer depth of field, and higher secondary electrons yield uh, due to its atomically sharp source and that helium and neon have low wavelength if we're comparing them to other um, to the electrons specifically, which minimizes the diffraction effect that limits the electron beam. Helium and neon ion beam surpass any other ion beam in milling small features. Hemp can be easily used to image insulators and biological samples with the aid of the electron blood gun that is equipped uh, to neutralize the surface charge without compromising the resolution. Helium ion beam offers advantages over the electron beam in lithography, higher resistance sensitivity, which means a very fast exposure. We don't even need to correct for any drift. Um, and we have lower proximity effects. Thank you for listening to me today. Um, and I'll be happy to take questions now if I can answer them. I love the cat. <laughs> <laughs> have to, right? So cute. Okay, so there's a couple of questions and please put more questions in the Q&A if you have any, and we're gonna take some time to answer them now. Uh, so the first question is, once the trimer is formed, how long is it stable for? So I've seen trimers that are stable for a few days um, and I've seen trimers that are stable for uh, two months. So it really depends on the state of the source, whether you have contamination and whether you actually use neon. So if you use neon gas, um, this will um, 
decrease the uh, the uh, the life of your trimer and you would have to reform the trimer and rebuild it but when you get enough experience with forming trimer it's really not that difficult especially if you have a good source you can keep using it especially if you are using lower doses you don't really need to worry about it getting weaker so even if it's staying and um not disappearing due to contamination or sputtering effects from using um, neon, um, it becomes weaker. So at some point you're going to have to form a new trimer, especially if you're looking at milling, you need to start from a fresh trimer because when you start with a fresh trimer, that's when you get the highest emission current, um, which means you're going to take less time to do your milling. So it really depends the answer. It can be a few days and it can be months, but I would say one to four weeks if you're using helium. Okay, um, with the Atlas software, um, that's the software being applied soon. Do you think this microscope could be applied to fib sem tomography? So yes, but it's fib him tomography because your primary beam is going to be helium um, um, and therefore you can do your milling with uh, with the gallium and image with the helium so yes you can do 3d tomography hey in the kirigami application why does the gallium beam cause the structures to curl is it related to electrostatic repulsion from implanted gallium ions I'm not quite sure why uh, that behavior happens. Um, I think it's related to stresses, um, but I'm not quite sure. It's just a very interesting paper that I came across that was published this year. Okay. I can get back to you offline. Okay, it was Travis who asked that. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, you know, uh, in your experience, do you find that charging is reduced using him in comparison to SEM, for example, for bio applications? Um, so charging is very different um, under a HIM because so clearly if you have charging with an electron beam, you have very bright spots and that's how you know you have charging because of the accumulation of the electrons. Whereas with the HIM, you have very, very dark spots um, uh, or dark regions because of the accumulation of positive ions that don't make their, um, they, they don't allow electrons to make their way to the detector. So to answer the question, it's hard to quantify the charging because because of the use of the electron flood gun, we really don't worry about charging um, with the helium ion beam. So I wouldn't say if it's less or more, I would say it's more just because of the, um, of the size of the electron, of the helium ion compared to the electron beam, but also you only have um, surface information on there. So it's really difficult to answer this question, mainly because we really don't worry about charging with the helium ion microscope because we use the electron flood gun to neutralize the charge. Okay, um, for patterning thin films, how does the wet etch helium lithography method compare to simply taking a gold coated sample and sputtering away the gold with the helium beam? Um, so they're completely different materials here. We're looking at MGO single crystal um, because you're mentioning the wet etch, you're not talking about gold, which I showed with the lithography or the lift off process. Um, which I think is what you mean. You mean like the gold uh, nanostructures that were fabricated on glass versus um, applying a gold film on, on, on a substrate and then making these structures. So damage is one of these things that are very different because of the doses that I use with the helium ion to just chemically modify the resist and then transfer the, the pattern into, um, into the substrate using liftoff process, I don't really need to apply as much dose as what you would do with sputtering away the gold with the, with the helium beam. And also it would take forever because here you only want to be left with these tiny nanostructures on the substrate, which means you have to 
pretty much spent forever, very not feasible to remove the rest of the gold film um, on top of the substrate. What people, what I have seen people do is um, maybe deposit a gold film everywhere and then use the gallium beam to mill around these structures in bigger um, areas and then use the helium and the neon beam to create even smaller structures. But again, these applications probably they don't care about damage um, because of the implantation of, of the sputtering. That was uh, a great presentation and we've made it through all the questions. Um, so if you have any questions after the fact or you're watching this webinar on YouTube, feel free to reach out to us. Um, all our emails are on ccm.mcmaster.ca um, and we'll get you in contact with Saba and you can start running experiments or asking her questions about um, specific experiments that you're thinking of running. Um, and thank you for the presentation. Actually, it was, it was super informative. I learned a lot about him that I didn't even know was possible. So thank you for that. Thank you for being here.